Hello, people. Hello. Um, so, I'm Alistair Dan. Uh, I work at the Guardian uh, newspaper in London, and my background is actually very much a software development background. And I was brought into the paper about three years ago now, and basically they they brought me in because they wanted somebody to lead a, an interactive team uh, to actually sort of in some respects construct that team and uh, basically bring together a set of skills which hadn't been assembled in a single team uh, other than on uh, you know very small number of occasions previously. So um, I think Bella's done a great job in sort of setting the, the scene. I think a lot of the things that she's just talked about apply to my team as well. Um, for example the the working patterns um, tend to be the same. I would sort of describe it more in terms of the difference between uh, news response work, which is generally sort of three hour turnaround, something you would do on the same day. Uh, in those circumstances, you're generally going to work from a template or something which is very simple because you have to basically move at the speed of the news. Um, when you've got a little bit more time, you have pieces which are uh, sort of three days to a week. And in those situations, uh, there might be a bit more time to collect data, to do some production work on that data. There might be some time to come up with a novel design. But what you're unlikely to do in a, in a week is to uh, take some risks. You're unlikely to try and work with new technology, and you're unlikely to try and build something completely novel. Um, occasionally, we've been forced to do something that should take three weeks in a week. I wouldn't recommend it, because it's, it's very draining, and then for the next few weeks, you're not really going to manage much at all. Uh, but yeah, basically the majority of our time we, we're working on sort of three to four week projects. And uh, that's the kind of perfect uh, time span, I think, for uh, taking a little bit of considered risk. So you need to, at the start of a project, figure out the kind of sweet spot, which uh, I would say could be found at the center of a Venn diagram. Or you've got three circles. And uh, the top one of those circles is uh, the actual narrative that you've got in mind. Uh, the second one is, is your data, and the third one is the technology that you have available. And the, the narrative component is kind of reflected, I think, ultimately in the design that you choose. Um, but what you're trying to find is the middle point. You have to have discussions with everybody around the same table, and you need to make sure that your journalists and your designers and your developers are all basically in accord about what the solution is going to be. So, my team uh, includes all sort of three of those types of people, and uh, every single project that we start, uh, we basically have to get to that point where we're all committed to what the project's going to be as, as soon as possible, so within the first sort of morning of the project, <laughs> ideally. Um, then, obviously, as we start to work with certain theories about what we're going to be doing, we might find the data doesn't support a certain kind of design, or, or we might find that, the, that there's kind of a you know, new aspect to the data. So in, in that situation, um, you have to be flexible. You have to be pragmatic. You have to be able to, you know, with one and a half weeks to go on a three-week project, maybe completely reimagine how you're going to do something because you realize there's a technical constraint that you didn't see before. So in that respect, uh, the people on my team who do the software development come from uh, digital agency and kind of games development backgrounds. Um, digital agency... Uh, environments are a pretty similar environment to newsrooms in the respect that they're very pragmatic. They have to uh, you know, be willing to drop a project and take a completely separate project if a client screams loud enough. So generally, if someone's been in that world, they're a little bit more hardened to making rapid, fluid changes than somebody who uh, perhaps has got a more um, uh, long life cycle software development background. I mean, I've done a bit of both myself, but I would appreciate that, that somebody who's doing longer form software development will find it a little bit um, uh, stressful to be in an environment where they have to work so quickly. Um, anyway, I'm going to move on and actually talk about three projects um, which give three different sort of uh, perspectives on how you can work with data uh, in the way that I've just described. So um, the first example uh, describes basically uh, the experience we have with WikiLeaks. Um, we were given what I would probably claim to be the cleanest data that I've ever received in the form of the uh, Afghan war logs. And um, the challenge that we had uh, in this case was to, was to build something in just over a week, which took that data 
and attempted to, um, well, just make something visually arresting. There wasn't much more editorial input. I sat in a small room um, with uh, Ian Katz, who's our sort of day-to-day uh, -day editor at the paper, and, and, and Julian Assange, and, and the only sort of real vision that they seemed to be articulating was that the experience should work a bit like a video. So kind of uh, perhaps going back to something that Bella was saying, when you're reaching your readers, you know, you've got different types of readers. And some people will want to be able to get to every last piece of data and examine it, and other people just want a passive experience. So having something which kind of works uh, at one level as a passive experience, and then maybe at another level as an exploratory experience can be a good kind of combination. So um, to actually see this piece in action, I'll say a little bit about it. What, what we had here was a, a log of every single IED attack over the course of a, a period of several years. And um, what we're basically doing here is we're playing those back over time. So uh, I think this is one of the things which is a real virtue of interactive interfaces. Um, we can actually plot that sort of path through space and time by playing the data back, by actually sort of looking as this, like a, a sort of video playback progresses, uh, you know, what events occurred when and, and where they occurred. And then as you can see, there's some sort of options there which mean that the key, unlike a sort of static graphic, the key is actually also a filtering device so that you can turn these categories on and off to help sort of zoom in and get a clearer sense of, of, of uh, you know, when particular kinds of events occur. And the other thing here is that uh, there is a kind of natural narrative to the data. It's not a narrative that we've imposed. The narrative is basically that, as you saw in the line chart, the number of events is escalating and escalating, particularly uh, as it gets towards this very fraught election in 2009. And so what you see here is this in insane amount of uh, activity and um, sometimes some, some quite serious consequences. And there's a kind of a, I guess, at some level, a kind of natural impact of just seeing that much data at once. There's, there's kind of going to be a question in people's minds as soon as they see that. You know, why, why was that much activity happening then? Um, so moving on from there, um, there's a, a project we did around the World Cup, which was quite popular. Um, and the editorial brief that I received in this case was, uh, well, fairly typical, I would say. Um, it was... We want to do something with Twitter for the World Cup. Um, we understand you can do very exciting things with Twitter. Um, you must make it distinct and lavish. They were the two words that I had to go on. And this was a bit troublesome because, you know, I, I've got this kind of software engineering background and I do prefer to have a, a kind of greater degree of, uh, you know, clarity. But um, I, I went on holiday uh, just before the, the project started. And as I was kind of walking around, this sort of sense of... Um, the roar of the crowd. Uh, it, it was just kind of my, my goal to basically find a way to, to visualise the roar of the crowd, to find a way of, of capturing what the kind of cr the voice of the crowd is doing in aggregate. So this isn't a very good video, but uh, basically what we did was um, we took uh, all the activity on Twitter that we could find that related to the World Cup, and we recorded it so that for every minute of every game. Uh, we had a record. Actually, this is sorry. This is a, a, a related project, which I'll just pause for a second. Um, okay. So, what we were doing here is, is basically for every minute of every game, we were running an election for word popularity. We basically had all the tweets and we divided them into these little buckets, so minute-long buckets. And then within each bucket, we basically figured out what the most popular words were. You know, all the way down to the least popular words. And by collecting those little snapshots, minute by minute. We were able to build it up into something which, which basically gives you um, a sort of like 90 minute long picture that you can replay in 90 seconds. So what we did is we animated between those frames of information so that you can see uh, these patterns as, as they emerge of, of word popularity. So um, we used the same format again, um, which I've got a better video of, uh, for the court hearings last year with the Murdoch, Murdoch Senior and Murdoch Junior. And um, there was a lot of expectation in advance of this hearing, that something was going to be said that was going to incriminate them. So as you can see in terms of uh, the overall sort of activity level, at the start it's pretty high. People kind of all tune in um, and there's a lot of activity on Twitter as people are kind of discussing what's being said. But it starts to drop off because they don't say anything that incriminates them. And in fact it gets to the point 
uh, sort of after a while where the conversation on Twitter, which is all still being kind of attributed back to this uh, particular topic, starts drifting off wildly into uh, you know, some kind of like comic uh, distraction. So as this is going on, um, you can see that something is coming up here. And I don't know if you sort of uh, remember from the, uh, the actual particular moment last year, but there, there you go. There's basically a, a moment where someone runs into the courtroom with a foam pie and attempts to put it in the face of Rupert Murdoch. And Rupert Murdoch's incredible uh, martial artist wife then does this kind of like um, lunge movement which uh, protects uh, the venerable Mr. Murdoch from said pie. But um, we were lucky in that sense. We were recording this basically because we thought there was going to be a, uh, you know, a moment where they incriminated themselves, and that would be the trigger on Twitter. And because we were recording it, you know, in this case, recording the data is a bit like recording video. We were able to go back, edit down to the particular section of data that was interesting, and then that formed the, the basis for this interactive. The other thing I'd say we did here, which is kind of worth considering, is we've got this annotation, which is on the left-hand side. So in addition to uh, providing this overview at the top, which kind of gives you the sense of the, the overall passage of activity throughout the day, we've got key events, which are marked by these quite faint lines um, across the, the day. And each of those key events comes up here in a panel on the side, which kind of gives you some context. So um, when I do my workshop tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about this in, in terms of uh, what we call the annotation layer. But I think it's something we use a, a lot. We basically give the editorial uh, sort of input to each project, uh, which creates this, this kind of contextualization. And we've also then got the most retweeted term um, in the bottom left, which is just another source of context. So one last thing. Um, we are um, in a, an amazing time with respect to uh, governments opening up data. Um, and it's sometimes a bit confusing to know how to deal with that. Um, obviously, there's a panel this afternoon, and I'm not going to talk about the sort of uh, you know, general uh, question of transparency or freedom of information, but um, I'll talk about a specific project that we did, which is, again, a uh, sort of fairly popular one. Um, the Treasury uh, were kind enough to publish uh, basically a comprehensive record of all public expenditure. Um, however, the Treasury, uh, and th they're not sort of alone in doing this, decided they would make that publication in a tranche of PDF documents with a very obscure table structure. So what that presented was the sort of first hurdle, which was that if you've got data in a form like this, sure, it's out in the public eye, but it's actually really hard to, to read with the machine and to do anything with. So the team that run our data blog were diligent and basically transposed all of that information into a far more usable spreadsheet. So that was sort of step one. Um, the second step was that our graphics team produced this, which I think is a, a really good example of sort of classic static print graphics in the sense that it's very high resolution. Uh, in the newspaper context, it would you know, occupy the full center spread. And that's something that's hard to do on the web. I know that screens are kind of getting better all the time, but right now, you can't put something very easily this high res on the web without needing to have like zooming and all sorts of other stuff. So um, being able to sort of see this all at once is really a, a virtue of the static graphic. But the nice thing about interactive interfaces is, is that firstly, you don't need to give people all the information at once. Um, you can give them a journey through the information. And secondly, you can make that journey uh, one which every reader uh, effectively can personalize for themselves. So just to, to quickly talk about this uh, spending challenge, uh, we took the same data and we basically created something which is almost akin to a game. Um, the challenge was, People had to uh, step into the departments depicted in this tree map. And for each department, they can make a series of cuts. And um, the cuts were rather editorialized to suit what we thought our readers might be interested in doing. Um, but they could also make sort of blanket cuts of a certain percentage. And as they basically make these cuts, they work towards this total of 49 billion, which was the chancellor's target for the budget. Um, and what we put into this project, which I have to say the BBC is very good at doing as well, is the ability for people to share their budgets with other readers. So we basically allowed them to uh, click a button to uh, produce a URL which would encode all their choices so they could share it. And we turned on the comments uh, at the bottom of the page because we didn't have time to create a sort of database to store the uh, feedback. So if you see here, by taking this URL and pasting it into the comments, you could you know, share your choices with other people and, and that became the basis for a, a dialogue, a conversation. 
And that, that's something which I think is a really important feature we're finding in our pieces. It's, it's this ability not only to allow people to have a journey through data, but to also then, when they reach the end point of that journey, take it and share it with other people. And I think at the point where someone's made the effort to, to share something of that nature, it's fair to say they're fairly engaged. Um, anyway, so in this case, the, the thing which emerged from the comments, which is the, the, the sort of thing I'll leave you with, is that um, the most popular way of solving the 49 billion dilemma uh, was to cut Scotland, which saved about 52 billion. And um, yeah, this was uh, sort of a pretty popular choice in the comments. Anyway, so thanks very much.